Hello everyone, this is Dr. Michael Arashik of Merogenomics, once again making an update video on the mRNA vaccines. And today I probably have one of the biggest and wildest news I can share with you when it comes to molecular biology impacted by either COVID-19 or vaccines. Definitely a game changer, so let's get started. Recently, just about a few weeks ago, this was in in the first week of October, a research team from Sweden published information that showed in their human cells that they were studying that the spike protein can actually enter nucleus. And the reason why this is such a dramatic news and why it's such a game changer is the fact that obviously nucleus houses our genetic material, all of our DNA, almost all of our DNA, mitochondria is the other place where you might find DNA. And what they also showed, and normally entry into the nucleus is supposed to be for a bolt and you're not supposed to be going, going inside there precisely because you could potentially be modulating how we're using our genetics. Now what did they discover is that once the spike protein enters the nucleus, it actually inhibits proper fixing of broken damaged DNA and the specifically damage of DNA where you introduce double-stranded break, meaning really you break both strands of the DNA, you share the DNA in half, you break it in half. And the way it does, does negatively impact how the DNA is being fixed is by somehow, it's still unknown, somehow interfering with how BRCA1 protein is supposed to be used in fixing fixing the, the, the DNA damage. Now, BRCA1, if you mutate that gene, it's one of the highest predispositional mutations for cancer development that you can have is mutations in this particular gene, precisely because BRCA genes code for proteins that are developed, that are involved in fixing DNA damage, such as fixing DNA that's sheared in half. So this is clearly news of great significance and it should not be taken lightly, it should be reinvestigated, reconfirmed, because this could not be real news. No, no offense to the authors, that's just how science works. There is uh, very frequently information that is discovered and published in science will turn out to be not true. That actually is very, very common and that's why you need validation and revalidation before something becomes considered to be of uh, of truth, scientific truth. You need a lot and a lot of studies. The other protein that is also somehow um, prevented from taking its action and helping fix the DNA once the spike protein enters the nucleus is this mysterious protein called 53BP1. It's not fully really known what that protein yet does. That's common for many of the genes in the human genomes. We're still characterizing much of that information. And uh, <laughs> and uh, but it's believed that potentially that protein might be involved in binding to the broken ends of the DNA to prevent their re-ligating or reconnecting to DNA from other sources. So basically making sure that two chromosomes that are not supposed to be linked together are not linked together. So why do the authors suspect this might be happening? They believe that potentially this is how the virus evolved this method in order to inhibit how our immune system responds in being able to combat infection. So keep in mind that when we produce antibodies or T-cell receptors, they can recognize pretty much any pathogen. So how do we achieve that? Well, the cells that are actually responsible for producing either the antibodies or the T-cell receptors, they can actually shuffle the genetic material that is responsible for production of these proteins, the antibodies or the, the T-cell receptors. So it cuts the DNA apart and then splice it in a, in a variety of different manners. And that's how you can literally produce any amount of, of these proteins being able to attack any pathogen. So by spike protein entering the nuclei and preventing this from happening, what it actually in essence would be doing is preventing the development of diversity of response to the infection. And I think this actually, this actually is a good example of our typical very broad oversimplistic view of viruses and vaccinations without the regard that we have to remember that these viruses, this family of viruses, have evolved with humans for literally thousands of years and they have developed many specific tricks 
to be able to fight our own immune system in order to be able to effectively infect us and promote infections between ourselves because that's all the virus wants to do is it wants to spread because that's the only way it can actually be produced is once it infects one of us so why is that potentially dangerous obviously is that in theory then the spike protein could be a mutagen because it prevents the fixing of our DNA. So this is why it's such an important information, especially in the context of the other recent information that was recently discovered that I discussed in the video number 16, I believe, where I talked about how spike protein post-vaccination can circulate in our blood for many months on end in the exosomes. And that means it could be circulating to any parts of our body, in theory entering any cell, and then the question is, does it enter nuclei of any cell and, and lead to the damage of the DNA? That's, and just, in, just to give you some context, uh, how often DNA is damaged and why it's so important to be able to fix it rapidly is the fact that it's estimated that literally every single cell of your body experiences something like 70,000 lesions per day in the, in the DNA per cell. Luckily, only approximately of those 70,000, maybe only 25 of those are the double-stranded breaks, meaning where the DNA is sheared in half, but those are the most dangerous ones. So it appears that the spike protein might be interfering with, um, with fixing some of the most dangerous damage to, to a DNA. And we need to be able to confirm this but this is very, very important. It's not something we want to be taking lightly and not something we want to dismiss easily. This is something we should be reconsidering because of the fact that we're obviously also considering doing boosters. And as I mentioned, BRCA uh, gene mutations predispose you to the highest likelihood of cancer development if you have mutations in those, in those genes. So how likely would it be that something like spike protein circulating in our blood either due to vaccination or due to natural infection could be predisposing us to cancer well it might not be very likely at all it just depends on how much of a damage occurs and to what degree can that promote cancer development when you have mutations in cancer predisposition genes it can take many many years before clinical symptoms show up and that actually brings me to another point is the whole concept of uh, of uh, mentioning that vaccines are safe the actually more proper way of saying is is the fact that we actually do not know what the vaccine spike protein proteins will do in our body post vaccination but on a short-term scale, they do not frequently produce clinical symptoms. That's the more real explanation. Not that they're safe, it's just that we don't know what they do, but they do not produce dangerous clinical symptoms in the first few months. But we don't know what it does on a very long-term basis. So could we, could this be producing some serious problems later on? Now, another mention that I should, another thing that I should mention is the fact that these authors mentioned that it requires a full length protein, full length spike. And that's exactly meaning entire protein. It's not a fragment of the protein, it's entire protein enters nuclei and, and, and causes this, and it facilitates or helps this damage to the DNA. Now, remember that the vaccines are indeed using full length protein. And prior to vaccination even beginning, there were actually scientists mentioning that this is potentially too dangerous and there's been publications warning that we should not make vaccines using full-length protein precisely because of potential adverse events that might be experienced so one of the publications that I recall mentioned specifically that one of the dangers is Mm, the antibody dependent enhancement so what is that 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 is when you can produce antibodies to the spike proteins and instead of those antibodies helping you fight the infection it can actually promote the infection unusual event but it's very real it does happen luckily rarely and now in fact in the process of this in, a, in the duration of this pandemic we're literally discovering new forms of of this event as well and i can also tell you that as a condition of the recent approval by the fda of the of the biontech mrna vaccine 
that's one of the clinical studies that they have to perform is to determine how likely vaccines themselves could be promoting promoting disease development so that's something that is still yet to be to be done but it's suspected that it shouldn't be the case nevertheless my point here is that the authors of that publication when they were warning up against using full-length spike protein in in the formulation of the vaccine that that was their worry and they were suggesting we should only be using fragment of the spike protein in our vaccines so specifically what is referred to as receptor binding domain so where is receptor binding domain that's it the, at the very apex the very top the peak of the spike protein if you will and receptor binding domain is the area of the spike protein that is used by the spike protein to interact with the receptors ACE2 receptors on human cells and that's how the virus gains entry inside human cells. So they're saying it would be much safer to simply build vaccines using that tiny fragment precisely so you can avoid other unknown effects such as the antibody dependent enhancement. Interestingly enough, the authors of this publication that I just mentioned from Sweden, they echoed echoed that warning that we should really reconsider redeveloping the vaccines we're not using full length protein but rather again just fragment of the protein specifically again receptor binding domain precisely to make them safer because of the potential danger that we might be discovering along the way and finally what that really means is that it shows you how still potentially these vaccines are still uncharacterized as to what they might be doing on a molecular level uh, to us once once they're injected and that's very real we obviously reacted as fast as we possibly could to to a global health danger but we still have to appreciate the fact that there's so many things that are uncharacterized about about what is happening with the spike protein post vaccination or post infection we're learning more about post infection about we still have to learn about what might be happening uh, after. So that's it for now. I'll end it right there and I will see you next time.